My name's Richard Hall. I work as a principal scientist on honeybee health at our animal health laboratory. And um, today I'm going to follow on from, from Haley's excellent talk uh, just about monitoring and treatment options here in New Zealand. And I appreciate, you know, there's probably a few more photos in this, in this one and, and just the pace of things just to outline how we, how we are doing things here in New Zealand. So here's where I work. Uh, it's in up, Upper Hutt. That's uh, very close to Wellington, probably sort of 30 kilometres north of Wellington. Uh, we have this very flash laboratory here, which is our animal health laboratory. Uh, it's about a $90 million facility that was built um, just a few years ago. And there we have two reference laboratory functions from the World Organization of Animal Health. So one of them's for American fowl brood, which we do have in New Zealand, and one of them is for Varroa. And the only other two reference laboratories for those bee diseases are in France and Germany. But I'll just say this, as, as a scientist uh, who works on bees, and I've worked with, with Haley for about the last eight years on them, uh, the lifeblood, I think, for any scientist is having that direct contact with the industry that you're there to serve. And I, I hope that comes across in this talk. And just on that note, uh, you know, with, with I, I hear sometimes from Australia about, um, you know, being able to learn from places like New Zealand about Varroa. And, you know, I, I understand it's, it's a very difficult thing having this particular parasite arrive in your country. But, but I would say it's not just a one-way street. Um, there's examples for us where we have been learning from those of you over there as well. And I'm just going to give a few examples here a few, quite a few years ago now. Uh, Hayley and myself travelled to New South Wales um, and worked there with these, um, Mark Page and Rod Burke, just learning about small hive beetle because we don't have small hive beetle in New Zealand. We, we don't want it, but it's very helpful to understand more about uh, this particular, for us, it's an exotic um, pathogen. And it, and it builds those relationships up. And about this time, you can see it's about 2019, uh, those, those two fellows, um, Mark and Rod, came across to look and, and learn more about Varroa here as part of their preparedness work. So you can see this is written up in the New Zealand Beekeeper. And we were able to put them in touch with the beekeepers here in New Zealand that are very helpful for, for our work as well. Um, you can see Alan Richards here showing Mark a frame of bees. And then, of course, when Varroa arrived across there in um, New South Wales, um, we probably had a little bit more communication with uh, folks in Australia about this and in this once again we wrote this up in the New Zealand Beekeeper um, just working with some folks so you can see there in the background John Roberts leaning on a hive from CSIRO uh, I think Agriculture Victoria are involved in this and uh, Un uh, University of Adelaide I think the eDNA centre there um, what they were doing was trying a different method for surveillance for Varroa, which uh, they would call an eDNA test. So you can see someone doing a swab here. And so it was really, you know, for us, an opportunity to try and provide some help. Um, they came across. We actually flew some hives from the Chatham Islands to New Zealand. Those hives were free from Varroa because Chatham Islands doesn't have Varroa. And we watched the invasion of Varroa into those hives in, in New Zealand in real time and then compared these monitoring techniques and uh, of course yeah, your um, researchers over there have been presenting on that particular study but it was it was a great opportunity to to help we've had more uh, contact with with the with the Australians here you can see a couple of uh, folks here who'll be familiar to you from agriculture Victoria so there's Nikki and Carla up, up the top there, your apiary biosecurity folks, uh, alongside myself, uh, a couple of um, prominent beekeepers we have here in New Zealand. So uh, you'll see there Frank Lindsay just down in the middle photo. Uh, he's with the Wellington Beekeepers Association, just, just showing some various techniques. And then at another point, uh, I know the Arbic folks have, have sort of publicised this. They came across with their bee biosecurity officers just to learn more and, and observe Varroa in the field. And I've just taken that from their website. So, uh, you know, as part of this talk, even having that 
connection to yourselves, I think uh, it helps to strengthen our biosecurity and understand the things we don't have, uh, but also the chance to provide support to yourselves. So I'm going to keep my talk here very, very simple. Uh, just I'm going to talk about varroa control and varroa mon monitoring. And I, I like to keep things as simple as I can in my head, and I, I just wanted to boil this down. So forgive me if you've seen these things before. It's kind of a, a repeat. Um, but if you haven't, I think it's, it's nice to have a once over lightly. So there's three kind of broad measures of control that we would use for varroa here in New Zealand. Um, they're, they're variously described as synthetic chemicals. Um, there are organic chemicals. I'll talk more a bit about those in a moment and just biomechanical methods, which are really sort of beekeeping practices. So I'm going to talk about each of those and break them down. So the treatment with synthetic chemicals, and I will say this applies to organic chemicals as well, there are registered products in New Zealand and they uh, will have been re registered in accordance with the Agricultural Compound and Veterinary Medicines Act. Uh, which is overseen by a part of the Ministry for Primary Industries. And uh, with the registration for those products, the manufacturers will uh, have some directions on how to use the products. And it's very important for our beekeepers in New Zealand that they, they follow the manufacturer's directions as in accordance with the product being registered, um, particularly so that you know there aren't residues left in in uh, beehives uh, with particular care being paid to the production season. So what I'm showing you here, um, there's three main chemical compounds for synthetic chemicals that are used in hives. They are tau fluvalinate, flumethrin and amitraz. Uh, there's various commercial names for those products but what you'll see uh, just holding a, a frame here is they go in as strips and there's, there's lots of little cheap things that you can learn from a a beekeeper in the field is some like to use toothpicks to hold those strips in, you know, some might use nails, but the, the strips are variously sell, sold with ways of anchoring them in. They usually, like talking generally here, are in hives for six to ten uh, weeks. It depends what the manufacturer uh, recommends. Uh, a, a critical thing, and I know it was touched on before about the notion of resistance, is that beekeepers really are advised to alternate treatment methods just to keep um, changing what the mites are exposed to uh, to try and head off uh, potential resistance. In regard to organic chemicals, and once again, like I'm not going to mention specific product names, those things are easy to look up, uh, but when we go out in the field and get to interact with beekeepers, you'll see them there. And, just, just same for, for Hayley, uh, as myself, I'm a recreational beekeeper in my time, my spare time. So uh, in, in regard to organic chemicals, you can see uh, this beekeeper pointing to a wafer and that contains the essential oil uh, thymol. And there's a few products there. Um, they, they just create a pretty unpleasant sensation for Varroa and make them fall off. There's another uh, product that uses formic acid and, um, and then beekeepers are also using oxalic acid um, and that is under the own use provisions in the Ag um, Agricultural Compounds and Veterinary Medicines Act. So they may apply that using cardboard staples or they may apply it using um, sublimation or vaporisation. You can see vaporisation being undertaken here. Th this particular vaporisation is actually uh, food grade mineral oil in that uh, particular presentation there, uh, uh, picture there. And then there's these biomechanical methods and you know one shouldn't discount these methods. Uh, what we've got on the left is a mesh board. Um, you know there is some scientific papers out there about mesh boards. When uh, mites fall off bees, if they fall onto the hive floor, a solid floor, you know one imagines they can climb back onto bees uh, with the mesh board those mites are kind of lost from the population. So, you know, it's not a major method of control, but as I say, you can find scientific papers on these things and, and come to your own conclusions. I'll talk a bit about mesh boards a little bit later in my talk, but uh, just to mention it there, you can see on the right-hand side, 
these are robbing screens. So beekeepers tell us, you know, they use these for uh, Varroa control as well. You can see there's a, a commercially manufactured product on the left hand side on that green hive. And on the right hand side, there's a do it yourself job. But uh, the theory behind these is that um, they reduce uh, robbing um, because the house bees, they only know that they know the way into the hive and um, robbing bees that may be bringing mites with them from other local hives don't really know the way in but they can smell the pheromones and they'll just come up to the screen and you know find it very hard to conduct a robbing mission probably as well these may have an effect on drift between hives and drift is a way that that varroa can be dispersed um, there's another couple of things i'll mention which is uh, brood breaks um, some people do use these if you don't have brood in the hive, then you don't have the growth media for Varroa. And that's often achieved using a queen confinement. I have to say, I, I don't, we don't really observe that in the field, but there are quite a lot of papers, scientific papers you can read, or um, it might be more of a widely used practice in, the, in European countries that we hear of. So this uh, colony loss survey that, that Haley refers to, it's been running here, I, I think it's nine, uh, it's probably coming up 10 years. It, it has been very, very useful. And I, I think uh, my understanding is we would say um, to yourselves over there, definitely get a, a colony loss survey going because understanding what's happening um, with your bees is best, is best coming from the beekeepers. And so a couple of graphs here, they're very busy. Uh, we'll just mention as well, just for recognition, the scientific provider of the survey is Manaki Whenua Land Care Research, and uh, really one of our, our colleagues who works at that organisation, Pike Stallman Brown, does a great job with uh, executing the survey, and New Zealand beekeepers do a wonderful job with responding to it. Uh, as Haley said, nearly 50% of beekeepers respond to the survey. That, that is world leading. If you see other countries, it, it can be a lot less. So that makes the, us more confident, I guess, in the, in the data coming from the surveys, people responding to it. So when we ask beekeepers, and you'll see this on the graph on the left-hand side, uh, did they consider their treatments mostly successful or completely successful? You can see there for, for Amitraz, one of the varroicide uh, synthetic chemicals that's registered for use. About 80% of beekeepers thought that it was mostly successful or completely successful. And the same goes there for flumethrin, a little bit lower, talflunavalinate about the same, uh, formic acid they thought was pretty good, a and perhaps with a little bit of variability there around the oxalic acid treatments. But you know, if you talk to beekeepers here, they're not just using one they're not just hanging their hat on one treatment. And that's what's here on this right-hand side diagram, uh, which, which is called an Euler diagram, and it's busy. But if you take, for, for anyone with more than 250 colonies, so these are really commercial beekeepers, and you ask them, what are you using? I wanna draw your attention to, if you can see this pointer, but you can search around with your eyes if you, if you can't see that. It says there 27%, and they're using a combination of, of this flumethrin based compound, this emitraze based compound, and oxalic acid. You know, that's a very common sort of strategy where they might use one in the spring, one in the autumn, and then try and use oxalic acid for the rest of the year as a kind of suppressive uh, treatment. But anything goes. There's all sorts there. Uh, the one right in the middle, 10%, uh, they're throwing everything at it. And you can see down the bottom left hand corner there. Um, with this, gr this group, and that this is for this particular year of the survey, for those with more than 250 colonies, nobody was doing no treatment. I know you saw Haley's graph there before, but I think this is a, a later iteration of the survey. For those beekeepers with lots of colonies, they all treat. So I'll just talk about monitoring a bit here, and I will say, and we do hear this from beekeepers too, it's, it's absolutely crucial, you know, if, uh, if you're not monitoring, it's a bit like driving down the highway with no speedometer and then being a little bit surprised when you get a speeding fine in the mail. Monitoring allows you to know that you're not 
doing more than 100 kilometres per hour on the highway, uh, you know, you can see what's going on. But it's tricky because it involves increased visits to the hive and particularly for commercial beekeepers, you know, Varroa already requires them to do more hive visits. Um, this is just one more labour input cost that they've got. I, I've just put here very simply, I've grouped alcohol wash, sugar shake and CO2 injection together. Uh, they're fairly similar, I'll show you shortly, and I, I think many of you are well aware of these things, but bees go in a chamber, you expose them to something reasonably noxious and mites will fall off and you look at the burden of mites and that subsample of bees and extrapolate that back to what's going on in the beehive. Something I'll talk a little bit more about is hive floor monitoring. Sometimes people call this sticky boards and I'll talk about that in a moment. And then as well drone brood uncapping. But those are kind of the main ways that we hear about. Um, you will see people talk about visual inspection. What do we mean about visual inspection? So if you forgive me here, I, I was having a bit of fun with this, but this is this is a few years ago and I had a hive and I thought, oh, this is great. I love looking at my bees coming in the entrance. You know, it's fun. You don't have to open it. Took a photo and then I had a look and I was like, hang on a minute. Here's one of these Varroa on the front. You know, it made me a bit worried and I started looking back through, through pictures. Here's another one. I thought, this is a great photo of a queen I've got here. And then I went back and looked at the photo and um, Hayley, who's been keeping bees longer than me, was like, look at this. There's, uh, there's these Varroa on these bees on the outside. And, um, like, you know, I really indulged myself with this presentation, actually. I started looking back through a whole bunch of photos. And, you know, here's some more if you, you sort of look at these suspects here. So I tell you what, if you see mites on bees, if you can visibly see them, the usual scenario is that that's not a good thing. Um, there, there are some scenarios like where you will see mites on bees when you've done a treatment, but they're coming in the front door, either from drifting or your hive perhaps robbing some other hive that's collapsing from Varroa. But usually if you're seeing them on bees, that's a bad thing. And as Hayley referred to, the paper from Sammy Ramsey and, and Dennis Van Engelsdorp and, and those folks at um, University of Maryland and, and others over there did that great work. Sh Haley showed you some of the electron micrographs. What you can see here was when they looked at bees, they pretty much found less than 1% of Varroa were hanging out on the, uh, on the thorax of the bees. Most of them were hidden under these, um, these uh, sclerite kind of segments there and you can't see them. So you can put two and two together and look at those previous pictures and say, if I saw one on the thorax, there's probably a hundred others I can't see on the adult bees. And then there's gonna be a whole bunch in the brood. And if you're just gonna rely on visual inspection, you're pretty much gonna end up at this situation here as a big old surprise. And if you see this parasitic mite syndrome developing and you think, I'm gonna put Varroa treatment in, chances are it's already progressed well down the track and you've got this sort of societal collapse here. So, um, you know, the, the workers when they're emerging uh, are just in a really sorry state and they're not able to look after brood properly. You can see perforations here. And, and the problem with parasitic mite syndrome is that it can disguise other diseases as well, like sac brood or AFB, and, th and that's a real problem for control. You can see honey stores are still here. These folks can't defend their hives, so other bees will come in and do robbing, and whatever Varroa is crawling around on these folks will, will end up back in you know, your neighbor's hives who might have just finished their Varroa treatment. You can see these guanine deposits on the side of the cells here as well, where the Varroa have done their, basically their pooping a uh, very sorry um, state of affairs. Not much you can do about that. Just try and salvage the gear and not let it happen. Haley mentioned deformed wing virus. Uh, you can see here a bee with deformed wing virus obviously has deformed wings, but they often have a kind of swollen abdomen and there's lots of behavioral things that this virus does which are not favorable for a hive. Sometimes if you've got rid of Varroa, this deformed wing virus can linger on in a hive as well. Uh, my understanding is that it's not present in Australia. That's my understanding. Um, but what I'm showing you here is a graph that's quite busy, but from 
uh, Fanny Monday's paper that Haley referred to about this Varroa front as it moved down the country. And it shows the, the prevalence of viruses before and after the arrival of Varroa. And I really am just going to draw your attention to this is that before Varroa, before Varroa, you can see deformed wing virus was very, very low in these populations in New Zealand, where, where it was afterwards you can see nearly 80%. Since that time, we've done studies and we've found, you know, a prevalence of the virus in, in the 90%. It's not always causing disease, overt disease, but it is there. And if you let Varroa go, then it, it creates a real issue for um, spreading that particular virus around. So how's an alcohol wash done? I'm sure you're familiar with this, but, but just forgive me, I will cover it. So uh, you shake a frame off of brood, of nurse bees. We often use the hive lid because it's convenient. Um, and for us, if we're visiting hives, we don't want to be shifting things around between people's hives. And we usually use methylated spirits in, in both Australia and New Zealand. My understanding is it's, it's just ethanol. The, the, the methanol component's not there anymore. It doesn't matter. Um, we use these plastic containers with a basket, half a cup of bees goes in, half a cup of bees is about 300 bees. And because we're using this for management purposes, we're not super strict about how it's conducted, but shake it for a minute, the varroa will fall off if it can look. And uh, this is Martin here from the Wellington Bee Club having a look at an alcohol wash. Um, I'm never sure giving online presentations how a dad joke goes but um this is what two dollars buys you is about 50 varroa so of course i'm joking there but but for scale you can see in the bottom of of the container um that's a lot that's a pretty bad situation there's more than 30 varroa that's more than 10 percent infestation that that hive is at risk and needs treatment urgently for beekeepers from the new zealand colony loss survey we ask them how many of your hives have more than nine mites per 300 bees and there's three groups here there's sort of low range commercial or shall we call them massively exuberant hobbyists in the top left you know that that some of them are having a bit of trouble there uh, more than 20 percent infestations but the larger commercial folks seem to to have it under control um, but there's always a distribution and we hear from beekeepers at apiaries that there's often one or two colonies out of the 40 a commercial might have at an apiary where they just haven't quite got their varroa management right and that poses that re-invasion risk that Haley had referred to. Drone uncapping. Um, you can see this rather unsanitary uh, uncapping fork this beekeeper has here but beekeepers poke an uncapping fork or, or simply flip open caps and look at drones and they'll say oh there's some varroa in there. But what we know from, say, the, um, the diagnostic manual for the World Organization of Animal Health or, or other things like the bee book is that you should be uncapping 200 drones and counting the number that have varroa on them to really understand the infestation level. And, and I have to say, it's been our sort of casual observation that doesn't, that's a lot of drones, beekeepers don't do that. So when we look at the colony loss survey, a lot of beekeepers tell us they are counting uncapping drones as a method as a method you can see that's the brown bar in the middle lot of uncapping drones but we'd probably like to see more people doing alcohol washes uh, which is the blue bar there and down on this right hand side those are the, the large commercials so these things called sticky boards um, high floor monitoring boards there's certainly shortcomings with these boards but they, perhaps by some beekeepers here in New Zealand, had started to be a bit overlooked because there was a sense you had to stick them in and then come back the next day and check them, et cetera, et cetera. So you can find this article online. We wrote it. It's called Reimagining Varroa Monitoring, a Practical Approach. And we had help from these beekeepers here who were involved in a field survey. So they would put these uh, boards in at the start of treatment and, and monitor uh, how the varroa were falling and um, it's pretty tricky to count them, this many varroa on a board. But what we found is that um, there was a, a number of, of apps online that would count them. We found this one called AP Zoom. You put 
yet another $2 coin on, and it'll actually count on this board here if there's nearly 1,500 Baroa, and those were dropped in the first 48 hours. Um, and then we ask beekeepers to return to the hive every week and take account. And this is a heat plot of Varroa that dropped over that time. Uh, red is lots of Varroa dropping, and green is much more acceptable levels, I would say. Of course, you've got to, so we're looking here from autumn through to winter. There was five beekeepers in this little field trial. Um, you know, they all got something out of it. You can see for most of them as we go down, the number of mites falling on the board reduced. Apiary B here, they had a lot of trouble. Some of these still had like many mites falling per day, 60, 60 mites falling per day at the end of treatment. So they knew that they needed to go and do something. Um, more than what they were doing. There are shortcomings with this method, so you can see for Apiary B, um, Hive 1, it looked like it was under control, but of course if your colony's dying or died, then there's not going to be many Varroa mites falling because it's not many bees. So, you know, high floor monitoring, if you combine it with alcohol wash, can give you a lot of information, but just care needs to be taken and thoughtful approach to monitoring. Some of these beekeepers liked it so much, they carried on for a year. I'm just going to flip these graphs up here for you, but this is a beekeeper looking at number of mites falling on those boards per day. Each coloured line is a, is a hive they were following. And you get here, that's the autumn treatment period. Through in winter, there weren't many dropping. We get back through, um, through, through the summer period and harvest, it was pretty good, and then back in autumn, they're, they're battling the varroa mite. And all of these black arrows are where they've administered a treatment. Another beekeeper in the trial, same thing. Um, this is over a year, starting in autumn on the left, and autumn on the far right there, and they were sort of hammering away at it, um, you know, identifying where hives had problems and administering a treatment. That's what these black arrows are showing here. So, uh, you know, we deliberately haven't mentioned what the treatments are. It wasn't a scientific purpose of the study to do this. It was just saying to beekeepers, what did you learn? And really what we found from those beekeepers in the trial is they thought, yeah, this is, this is something interesting, not just alcohol washes, but looking at what's falling through that mesh board at the bottom of the hive. So just, just winding up here, I just reiterate uh, what Hayley had said as well. There is this really great resource, uh, Control of Varroa, written, written by uh, Michelle Taylor and Mark Goodwin uh, from over here in New Zealand. I think that, that book is still, of course, available. And then we've got some resources here on our own website. If you search for Bee Biosecurity New Zealand, uh, you can see um, some of the things that we've published about Varroa. And I know many Australian folks uh, have contact with New Zealand beekeepers who, uh, you know, we're always learning things from. They're out there doing doing this work with Varroa in the field. So uh, thank you very much. I guess I'll speak on behalf of both Hayley and myself. I haven't put my email address there. Not not deliberate. It'll just be richard.hall at mpi.govt.nz. But uh, Hayley and I talk every day, despite Hayley being uh, based in Auckland. So thank you very much.